this is a new title for an old lesson. People, people uh, you know, if they see the same title they came to last time when I came and spoke, they might not come again. <laughs> so we gave a new title to the lesson, but I added a few new slides of current textbooks, Nurturing Our Cherished Myths, How and Why We Study History. This is a, a, a picture of a very old book, and this very old book is quoting from a very old book. This is older than Gutenberg. Now, just today, I got a deposit in the mail from another museum, and we're, going to, we're commissioned to build our 51st printing press, a Gutenberg replica to go into a museum in Tennessee. This is, my, this is the way I make my living. I make old-fashioned things. So it was exciting to get that in the mail today. Another Gutenberg. That'll be the fourth Gutenberg. How many of you have been through the Crandall Printing Museum in Provo? Good. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? It's a great exhibit. We've enjoyed the, the Crandall Museum also. We built four of their presses. So that's our occupation. But this old book, written long before Gutenberg came up with the printing, written long before the birth of Christ, in it we read, of making many books, there is no end. <laughs> now on the back side, right over here on the other side of this wall, they have piles and piles and piles of books. Books and more books. What should we read? And if we read it, what can we trust? Let's take a look at some of the examples that I brought with me tonight. This is a little corner of one of my, the wall in my garage. This is my library, my garage wall. It's unheated. It's kind of cold out there right now. And I go in there and I find a book. It's an old book. There are lots of old books. Old books means that they're older than I am. They're really old. <laughs> and in this one old book, I read the allegory of the apothecary. Now, what in the world is an apothecary? I had to look it up before I understood. The apothecary was the word for the pharmacist. And so in the old days, the apothecary, and this is the apothecary painted in 1646 by Adrian van Osterdad or something like that, Ostadel. In, and he, he labeled this the apothecary smoking his pipe. <laughs> That's the name of this picture. Well, here's this apothecary, and in his room he has many, many bottles filled with various kinds of liquids and substances, and each of these bottles contains something he hopes he can blend together for a remedy. You come in and you complain to the apothecary, I have a sore throat. Ah, he says, I know the thing for you. And he goes to the shelves and he takes a little of this, and a little of this, and a little of another one, and he stirs them together, and then he gives you the new remedy. Ah, but in the allegory of the apothecary, the author says, what if the elements he uses are tainted? The apothecary mixed them in good faith. He was a good man. He had only the best intentions. And then the allegory says, books are written in the same way. The author has good intentions. And he goes to many different sources, and he pours them all into one, he stirs them together, and he has the finished product and says, this is a new book. Of making books, there are many. Now, I suggest, you know, since Congress is so ready to do these kinds of things, we have a label on things like this. They certainly do it with the Food and Drug Administration. Warning, this otherwise wholesome product may be tainted. Well, let's go to these shelves. This product is a new book, we'll say. They poured a little from this book and a little from that book and a little from another book. They put them all together. Maybe we should have Congress pass a law that on the back of every book it says, warning, these books may contain myths mixed with truth. I mean, they do it on cigarettes. Cigarettes are probably less harmful than the books that have falsehoods in them. I'd rather smoke a cigarette than read a book with a lie and believe it's true. Are there any books that way? What is history? Now, we're going to talk about history books tonight. We're going to give you examples. <laughs> what is history? I went to my dictionary. I really wanted to know. I'm not a historian. I'm a craftsman. But I do have this, uh, this reputation for building objects that are historically correct. That means we did it right. We followed the correct procedures and made them like they were in the old days. I went to the dictionary, and this is the first definition that came up out of the dictionary. An account of what has happened. Really? <laughs> Think about it. this next one. The story accepted by the public. <laughs> this next one. A set of lies agreed upon. 
<laughs> now that came from George Santayana, a well-known scholar and beloved person, a set of lies agreed upon. This is, the, this is the definition I believe is the best one. A history professor records this in his book as his belief. This is history, he says, evidence. Evidence accompanied by reason and debate. And so tonight I'm going to lay out evidence of the assertions that I make. And I'm not, I have nowhere near enough time to give you all the evidence, so we'll just give you some samples of evidence so you can start to read books, hope, hopefully with a better Beware, this book may contain tainted material. And then there's, oh, yeah, oh, that last one is a good one. Ralph Reichel, the history professor, asked these students, what is history? And one of the students blurted out, it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> OK, these are all different definitions of history. Now, Thomas Paine, in his book Common Sense, in the very first sentence, made a wise statement to launch his book to his pamphlet, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right. Now, there are a lot of things for a long time we haven't thought were wrong in America. And so we finally think, well, they must be right. We haven't thought they're wrong. What, for example? Could you possibly come up with an illustration, Mr. Pratt? Let's go to this book. I, I, I wasn't always a reader. But 35 years ago, my neighbor, Joe Ferguson, are you here tonight, Joe? Yes, sir, right out here in the hall. Thank you for not crowding the room. <laughs> Joe Ferguson, I tell you, he came to me and he invited me to go to a lesson on history. I didn't like history. I knew it was a despicable topic. I had graduated from BYU with a master's degree in education. I held lifetime credentials in teaching. And in addition to that, I did my further graduate work at Berkeley in the 60s. Uh, could anyone teach me anything I didn't already know? Well, Joe, thank goodness, believed that I didn't know it all. And I still don't. But he invited me. And I went to a lecture over here in a garage not far from here. Just an old, dirty garage with cracks in the floor, dusty old gravel driveway, only a few cold, folding steel chairs. And an old, bald-headed old man stood up there that I'd never seen or heard of before. And he talked from his heart that night. And I felt something for the first time in my life I had never felt before. And I knew that I loved America. And I knew it then, on that night. And I went up at the end of his lesson, and I said, I don't know you, and you don't know me. But what do I have to do to teach for you? Oh, he says, do your homework. <laughs> that means read books. And so I started reading books. And two years later, he invited me to give my first talk. And that was the beginning of a great, great experience, studying and learning. This book, The Basic Symbols of the American Political Tradition by Wilmore Kendall and George Carey. Many books will come on the screen tonight. This is one that I enjoyed. I read it, then I read it again. I'm a slow reader. I'm a better craftsman than I am a reader. I can fit wood together easier than I can fit words together. But I read the book carefully, and I remembered some of these key parts. On page 19, they speak of myth, myths used to manipulate people. Now, these are political science professors. How do we know they're telling the truth? How do we know their book's not tainted? And so I've learned to read critically. I never believe anything I see in print until after I worked on it for quite a while. But they put this in, and I thought, that's worth pondering. Myth is used to manipulate. Falsehoods, false educational ideas used to manipulate people. Another one caught my interest, Civil War derailment. What do you mean? I mean, I thought that was a wonderful event that saved the Union and freed the slaves. No, they say it was a derailment. And then they give a chapter or two on that topic, how we were derailed, how before that war we were a government by compact, and after that war we, are, we were a government by conquest. From compact to conquest is their assertion. Oh, maybe that was the tainted part. And then they go on. The official literature. Over and over again, they refer to the official literature. These are the books that are accepted, the story accepted by the public. Remember that definition? That's the story everybody knows to be true. They've been hearing it their whole life. Their great grandmother heard the story. And they say those are myths sometimes used to manipulate. That's the official literature. 
But the big question's on page 85. On page 85, they ask this question, and I hear it all the time. One, one woman said to me, Mr. Pratt, I like your lectures, but they're much too long. Can't you just tell us what to do? <sighs> okay, what should we do? America's in an awful situation. It's terrible. I mean, we can't even read the, the Constitution in Congress without being, you know, nasty comments made about it. What shall we do? Well, these two authors say it's very clear what we should do. We have to answer these two questions before we answer what should we do. Who and what are we as a people? We need to study our history. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, they expect what never was and what never will be. That's a great statement to memorize. This book I had the privilege of working on all those many years ago, not long after the old professor said, I need to have you come and start speaking for me. He gave me a, a research assignment. And the research assignment was the first, became later the first chapter or the first uh, principle of liberty in this book. It's the principle of natural law. And that was a great experience for me, my first research assignment from a craftsman making things of wood and steel to a student in a library reading about natural law. What a contrast. That became the national bestseller last year. Probably some of you have read it. Who's read the book? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. They're out on the table, $5 donation. If you don't have $5, I'll give you one. Just take it. Clear, clear them out. Don't go, I don't want to leave here with 5,000 year leaps on the table. The 23rd principle in the 5,000 year leap pertains to the topic of education, the importance of an educated electorate but we didn't go far enough. We didn't explain enough what you needed to learn or cautioning about tainted material. We simply gave a bit of history of the early time in America when people were encouraged to learn. I added this little part here, the importance of an educated electorate who have learned the truth about liberty. Now, it doesn't do you much good if you've learned the truth about veterinary science or about home economics or any other number of subjects that you could learn. I'm going to be a wonderful craftsman and make beautiful printing presses, or a great lawyer. But if you don't understand the principles of liberty, you won't be able to save and preserve it. So we have to add that element to our learning. This book's really fascinating reading. It came out first in 2000, or 1995, right up here. In 1995, lies my teacher told me. What an interesting topic. Well, here's the man that wrote it. Mr. Lewin, James Lewin, PhD from Harvard University, with other words, he's a history professor, and he decided in 1995 to publish his research on 12 books. Now he has 10 of them piled up on his knee here. These are high school history books, and he kept having students come in from high school that didn't seem to have a grasp of what happened in American history, and they had conflicting viewpoints, and so he decided it was worth his time to read 12 high school history books. Now he said, this was not easy. I weighed them first. <laughs> American history, I've read this one. American history, 5.3 pounds, 1,088 pages, 12, 12 of those? And then he did this analysis and he published it under this title, Lies, My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. And as soon as I read that, I thought, Beware, this book will have tainted material because he just claimed he had everything. Is that possible? <laughs> I'm serious. I look at books like that. I see everything. I know the guy's not, he does oh, of course, that's just his title. <laughs> we'll give him a little slack. He did a good job of reporting on those history books. And then 10 years later, in 2005, he decided to do it again. This time he took seven. And he said, after, after he got down through you know, four or five pages of explaining his experience, he said, but I didn't read them all the way through. They were just too boring. <laughs> I recommend that history teachers use two textbooks so that students may realize the contradictions. Well, I recommend they use 10 or 20 and start studying and find out how many myths are used to manipulate people. You can't do it with just two, but it would help if you read two. He goes on to explain that most high school students, after they graduate, 
will never read a history book again. So whatever they had in high school is all they get in the Alpine School District, or any other school district for that matter. He has another great quote in there. It's this one. Old myths never die. They just become embedded in the textbooks. <laughs> Here's a man I want to introduce you to. He's my chairman for the program in St. George in two weeks, Robert Allen. He ran for school board. He lost, but he did run. He ran because he believes the history needed improving. And I enjoyed this one little sentence in his flyer, his leaflet that he handed out. The prevailing situation in this country is that students in the public schools are taught a perverted history of the United States of America from textbooks that have politically correct omissions and distortions. Now, he said a lot in that sentence. We'll give you some examples this evening from textbooks that have omissions and distortions. We'll, we'll give them the correct names. The politically correct, we will show you also. Here's one of them. This, this book's in, uh, only, only a few weeks ago, a girl called from Cedar City High School. She, she's one of my family friends. And she says, Mr. Pratt, I'm concerned that my, my textbook has some things in it that are false. Oh, could that be possible? <coughs> and so, so I thought, well, I'll get the book. I didn't think it. I told her, well, I'll get the book and take a look at it. So I got the book and I looked at it right there on the front cover. I started right out. Well, this book's got a problem. What's the problem? They're going to talk about United States government. You know, the one that our founding fathers created? Can you go back to the writings of the Founding Fathers and find one positive statement about democracy? One? No. No, all they said were bad things about democracy. Not one positive statement about it. And yet this author chose to put that on the front cover of his book published in 2003. Wonder why he did that. Well, let's take a closer look. Oh, here's another part I enjoy. Texas edition. That's on the front page. Great big bold right up in the corner. Big star. The Lone Star State approves this book. Why is that significant? Because only a few weeks ago, some of you probably heard on CNN that the Texas School Board had recently decided to improve their history books. They were going to start telling the truth about the United Nations. That would be different. And they were going to start telling the truth about Joseph McCarthy. That would be different, too. And they had several other things they were going to change in the Texas history of America. And then, all of a sudden, we get a news release from California State senators in California preparing bills to go before the California legislature to ban all Texas history books huh. in California. Huh. See, this is what's going on right now. It's been going on for 200 years. Why didn't he call it something really, truly descriptive about American history, our own government that our founding fathers created? Perhaps he could have called it United States government, liberty by rule of law. That would have described, perhaps, about our government. Or he could have called it United States government, a republic of republics. That would have been very appropriate. And that explained in the history book why that title is so fitting. But he didn't. Now, a news release came to my mind. As I read the front cover, as I looked upon the front cover, I thought way back in, oh, it was back in 1982 when I was a researcher in the musky dank corners of the BYU library. I came across a newspaper article, May the 14th. I remember that about two days ago when I made this slide. And in that article, it said, headlines, Karl Marx goes to college. Most of you probably think that Karl Marx is dead. He is not. He is alive and well on college campuses today. This was a great article in 1982. It goes on, thousands of college professors now openly admit that they are socialist. Oh, really? <laughs> That's different. Where is Marxism most effectively taught? In United States history. Now, this is an absolutely correct article. Well, I looked at this history book, and I thought, you know, this professor, Dr. Remy, and he might be a wonderful guy just like the apothecary. He might be gathering from this source and that source and pouring them all together and stirring it all up and handing it out. So this is my new 2003 history book. Might be a wonderful person. But maybe some of the material was tainted. This is a cherished myth, democracy in action. If you can't find an endorsement from the Founding Fathers on democracy, Perhaps we could go across the Atlantic to the other side about that same time and see if we could get an endorsement for democracy there. Well, we can. This man endorsed democracy. Huh? Who's that? Who's that? 
Come on, who is it? It's Karl Marx. That, in fact, is the, is the picture on the front cover of Time magazine a few years ago. Now, they've tainted it just a little with their bias so somehow. They put the sickle and hammer up there and show a steaming hot pot coming out. But nevertheless, Karl Marx endorsed history in the Communist Manifesto. Excuse me, he endorsed democracy in the Communist Manifesto. He said, the first step is to establish democracy. The first step to what? The first step to communism. Oh, really? That's an endorsement of democracy, is it not? It's the first step to what he desired. Well, he wasn't the only one that, did more de <laughs> that endorsed democracy. Uh, well, by the way, I thought that other picture was a little harsh. If we're going to put it on the history book for an endorsement, we want a more politically correct picture. And so we put on a more peaceful one like a professor. And the professor, now we've toned down from bright red to pink. The first step is to establish democracy. Here's another one that endorsed democracy. Who's this? You ever, ever heard of Vladimir Lenin? Yeah, he really believed in democracy. He really did. He said, democracy and socialism are inseparable. Oh, really? That means the author of the book could change the title, and it would mean the same thing if it said, United States government, socialism in action. This is the inside front cover. I open one big, the big thick part, not even a page yet. I'm on the, the, you know, the inside cover of the book. He's not going to waste any space. Every square inch will have something in it. Honoring America. And then at the top we read, for Americans, the flag has always had a special meaning. It is a symbol of our nation's freedom and democracy. Is the flag a symbol of our democracy? Well, that's, that, if that's not confusing, go down here, and he has the Pledge of Allegiance. And they pledge allegiance to what? To a, a democracy? How confusing can we be? But then over here, it gets even worse. He says a democracy is in a republic. Oh, really? I su submit for your consideration that there are some tainted bits of material in here that will be confusing and misleading. And they will mislead in a specific direction to which the author intends them to go. We'll show you the direction. It gets worse. Page 89, 108, we read these phrases. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868. The 16th Amendment ratified in 1913. The 17th Amendment ratified in 1913. Is there any problem with this? There's probably not a person in here that can say there's a problem. None of these amendments were ever ratified. Oh, Mr. Pratt, now get up, go ahead, walk out, it's okay. I had somebody do it recently, a group of teenagers. I'll show you the slide that caused it. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, you mean, you're, a, you're, Mr. Pratt, you're telling me they were never ratified? That's what I'm telling you. You go out in your history and you find a place where they were ever ratified. Numerous books will claim they were, and it always says they were. Ratified in this year, ratified in that year. Research has been done. There is no evidence that they were ever ratified. Have you ever heard that before? Not about all three of them. Most people haven't. Let's go on. I'm, ch I'm challenging your brain to think. Come on, brain, stir up in there. Stir the pot. Page 11. The United States is a wealthy country. You know, I read that. And I thought, ah, what do they mean, wealthy country? And I thought of an allegory. I made this one up. The allegory of the house on the hill. Let's suppose that there was a family living in a great mansion on a hill. And they were a very happy family. And they had all they could to eat. And they spent all they could spend. They had big cars. They had SUVs and flat screen TVs. They had everything. Well, the trouble was the family was completely overwhelmed with an incredible debt. In addition to that, they said, let's spend ourselves into prosperity. And so they put up printing presses and computers in the basement, and they started creating money out of nothing. Lots and lots of money. Do we have more needs? We'll spend. We'll create more. And they kept spending and spending. This family was having a wonderful time. Print, print, print. Spend, spend, spend. Borrow, borrow, borrow. Hmm. They accumulated more debt than all the other families in the whole world combined. Is this family wealthy? Now, page 11 continues. First it says, we are a wealthy country, nation. 
Our wealthy country has the responsibility to redistribute the wealth to our citizens and to foreign countries. For example, the government can make payments to farmers who raise certain crops or allow tax advantages to certain industries. It goes on, a whole page on this, how the government should spend this wealth that we have, giving it away to farmers and industries and foreign countries. This is your history book. I, don't, I tried to find out if it was in this district. I don't know because the district didn't know either. Is it? Yes, I, I substitute. And okay. I it's just a typical history book. Don't knock it. They probably couldn't find a better one. I, I'm, it takes a good history teacher to handle this kind of a book, and you hopefully have some. I trust that you do. If you're a substitute and you're here, you're a good one. Okay, it, it, here's, here's the assignment, by the way. This is the assignment after you've studied about giving away the country's wealth. Write an opinion paper stating your position on the following question. Should the national government distribute money to states today with no strings attached, or should the money be directed towards specific programs? <laughs> There's nothing in there about whether the money should have been spent at all, or if it's even constitutionally being spent. Here's another one, page 107. They first give you a little summary about uh, that much column space on states' rights, then they give you some column space on nationalist, the nationalist position. And then they declare, it was the people, not the states, who created both the national government and the states. The Supreme Court established the national pos nationalist position in 1819 in McCulloch versus Maryland. And then they go on to explain that after the nationalist position was established, they continued doing more things to establish it with a firmer hold until it's the way today. <laughs> we are nationalist not states' rights list, as they call them. Any problems with this? Page 771. The name United States was first used in 1776 when the 13 British colonies became states by declaring their independence. Is there anything true in that sentence? Is there any part of the sentence other than the English grammar being correct? No. No. There are two errors I'll point out to you. Two cherished myths, two bits of false educational information. The name United States was first used in 1776 in the Declaration of Independence. True or false? False. You're an unusual audience. States United. Thank you. <laughs> Let me give you, I'm just giving you a sample. I'm trying to get your brain cells churned up in there so you go home tonight and there's some heat between your ears. <laughs> Here's an example of what we call evidence. This is a sample of evidence. We're going to look at the name United States, and we're going to see if it really appears on the Declaration of Independence. Now, I just pulled one up that was easy to get off the computer, and this is the 1823 engraving by printer William Stone. Now, pay close attention to the title. The Unanimous Declaration of the, uni of the 13 United States of America. Is this a, a misprint? Didn't the, uh, the, uh, the man that created this have better sense? Doesn't he know how to typeset? Why did he put this in little tiny letters? It's because it wasn't the name. It was not the name of a new nation coming forth on the 4th of July because one did not come forth. Huh? You haven't heard that lately, have you? There was no new nation created on the 4th of July. We'll find out in detail tomorrow what they did create on the 4th of July. That's the lesson. The Republic of Republics will give you the evidence line upon line. But focus for a moment on this. That is lowercase U-N-I-T-E-D and then uppercase states. Is this the name? Now, if that's not enough to convince you, go do your own homework. This is just a sample, a small sample, how we look at evidence to make conclusions. This word combination is not a proper noun, the name of the new nation. It is not the name of a new nation. Two cherished myths. The second one is this one. The 13 British colonies became states by declaring their independence. True or false? Now, you're, you're, you're primed up. Now, you think you're going to go with what you think the right answer is. I don't think there's a person in American Fork you could corner on the street, just stop them on the street and get them to say that was false. Oh, yeah, that's true. We became states. When we declared our independence, we all know that, don't we? False. What's the evidence? 
Well, how about if I can show you one piece of credible evidence, does that make this false? If it's trustworthy, credible evidence? I own this piece of evidence. It's mine in my library. In 1774, Thomas Jefferson was commissioned as part of the House of Burgesses to write a complaint to King George III explaining why they felt George was out of place. And in that complaint, the complaint was called a summary view of the rights of British America. He wrote, resolved that it be an instruction to the said deputies when assembled in general Congress with the deputies from the other states of British America. Huh? This is 1774. What's Thomas Jefferson got? He, he's all mixed up. They were colonies, weren't they? Isn't that what you've always heard? Yeah, we always heard they were, well, yes, that's a correct term also as colony. But he also uses the word states repeatedly. I started counting them, and then after a while it got too tedious, and I finally decided it's not worth it. All of the examples where he talked about these, these distinct entities, he referred to them as states in 1774. And you will find out why tomorrow in the lesson, Republic of Republics. I'm giving you a sample of evidence. Don't have time for the reason and debate part. Page 108. The Constitution's flexibility has allowed the Supreme Court, Congress, and the President to stretch the government powers to meet the needs of a modern industrial nation. You know, I read a history book not many years ago, and it said Thomas Jefferson was right. The Constitution is like a chain. You've heard that one, haven't you? It's like a chain, and it's supposed to draw the government and hold them tightly within the bounds that their enumerated powers grant them. But then the textbook went on. Yes, the Constitution's like a chain, a rudder chain, made to be stretched. <laughs> Do you believe that? I don't either. I'm giving you some examples from a history book that's being used in your school district. United States Government Democracy in Action. My conclusion is, this book is a mixture of truth and cherished myths promoting the nationalist position. It is not just poor scholarship, it is good scholarship carefully done to promote the nationalist position. And in great detail tomorrow, in the lesson on state sovereignty, the original concept, we will lay out side by side the nationalist position and compare it to the state's rights position. This book definitely de deserves to be classed with the official literature, the story accepted by the public. It could also receive the stamp of approval as being politically correct. It's just a normal book. I don't think you can find a book that's any better among the official literature writers. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody says, they sneak the 5,000-year leap into my classroom occasionally, <laughs> but that's pretty hard to do without getting you know, in trouble with your administration. Now, I'm going to introduce you to another historian. Now, the last one, a fully credible historian. I don't question he was a good person. I don't know him at all. In fact, I called up his name on the website to see if I could get a picture, and there wasn't any web presence other than he wrote this book, this big, thick book. Now, here this man has some web presence. He's another history professor, Dr. Thomas Woods. He received his bachelor in history at uh, oh, Harvard and his doctorate at Columbia, and he wrote this national bestseller, <laughs> a politically incorrect guide to American history. He's just taking a jab at the airs, kind of like the professor that wrote, lies my teacher told me. So here's the politically incorrect guide, national bestseller. Dr. Wood also wrote, oh, by the way, we can't pass this up. This is Ron Paul's endorsement right at the top. Ron Paul wrote of this book, Professor Woods heroically rescues real history from the politically correct memory hole Every American should read this book. Now, it's actually just a little short book, and to me it's kind of disappointing. It should be about eight inches thick instead of just a half an inch thick as he gives the politically incorrect approach to history. He wrote another book that I found valuable also, 33 Questions About American History You're Not Supposed to Ask. <laughs> okay. And in that book, he has a couple of worthwhile quotations we could read here. When you sever the historical roots of a people, you destroy the nation. How? Future generations of Americans cannot be prepared to fight for the ideals, history, and direction of the country 
if they don't have any idea of what their ancestors did, what they endured, and how they confronted those circumstances. After these ties are severed, a false past can be taught. Then almost any radical, ill-advised charge can be made to the fundamental structure of our government, as long as the charge is promoted as increasing justice and equality, whether such a claim is true or not. That's a very common sense statement to help introduce the importance of studying history. This is a valuable read. Another professor, <laughs> by the way, you don't have to be a professor. Two of my proud heroes are right over here. Are you a professor, Carolyn? No. Are you a professor, Gary? Well, I profess a lot of things. Yeah, he professes <laughs> things. That's me too, I profess <laughs> things. We got, we got one of their publications out on the table. No professor could do it better. It cannot be done better, in my opinion, than what they've done on their research. Oh, we won't spill the beans. That comes in tomorrow's lesson. It's out on the table. Professor Ivan Eland, The Empire Has No Clothes, obviously taken from the title of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, The Emperor Has No Clothes, U.S. foreign policy exposed. With other words, he felt that no one had presented U.S. foreign policy in a good light, and so he did it again. He took a little from here and a little from there and stirred it together and put out a new book and did a good job. The Naked Truth About U.S. Foreign Policy. What is history? Focus on this definition. It's evidence accompanied by reason and debate. Now this is evidence. Actually, this isn't, this isn't the evidence. This is the result of the evidence. I build printing presses. It's our, it's our, our main bread and butter. You know, you make your living by programming computers or teaching classes in school or whatever your occupation is. I make mine by fitting wood together. This printing press was commissioned by the United States government. We're installing it here in the United States government printing office. Yes, that's right in one of the, you know, they have more than one. It takes more than one to print all the things they print. Well, this is the government printing office in Philadelphia. In fact, it was Benjamin Franklin's grandson's print shop. And we're putting in a new printing press for them July the 5th, 2007. They said before we came, please don't come to Philadelphia on July the 4th. It's much too busy here. But streets were pretty quiet on the 5th. And so we, and that's my son back there, Ben, installing the press, finishing the job up. Guess what they print on it? The Constitution of the United States. If they would just read it. We put a plaque on. This plaque says, this. you know, we built this press in this year because another 100 years from now, someone might look at the press and think it was an original. What do we do to create an accurate press? I went to the Smithsonian Institute and I studied the original that we were going to duplicate. Okay, that's a good beginning, isn't it? And then another professor had already taken the trouble to make all the measurements and draw beautiful drawings. So between looking at the original and studying its use, and I had as much time as I wanted, the curator loved me, still does, good guy, Stan Nelson. And we finally understood that press and then we came home with those wonderful drawings and we built what we would call a museum quality reproduction. That means it's good, good stuff. You can't afford it, none of you. It has to be <laughs> federal tax dollars to buy something like this. <laughs> then we walked around the corner and in, in this beautiful, I mean, this was an awesome experience for me. We walked around the corner, went into Independence Hall and stood there in the room where the action was, where our constitution was created. It was an awesome, enjoyable experience. This is my son, Ben. They gave us our own personal tour guide, and he was showing us through the building, and we stopped it and long enough to listen to this tour going on. And in the background, I could hear the, the tour guide saying, at the end of the tour, because our Constitution is a living, breathing document, the government established by our founding fathers in the late 1700s is alive and well today. Yeah. You got any problems with that? Is that the story accepted by the public? Or is that tainted? You have to decide. I heard that. I took notes. I wrote it down. 52 years earlier, a well-known and respected author named John T. Flynn wrote a book called The Decline of the American Republic. Well, now, if our government is alive and well today, then his book must be wrong or else his book is right and the other statement is wrong. Which one is it? You'll have to decide as you study. 
In this book, he says, it is difficult to escape the feeling that most of the young men and women in most of the young men and women who passed through our colleges in the years from 1933 to the present time do not have the faintest conception of the type of government which Americans for a century and a half knew as the American Republic. I graduated from the university during that same time that he's referring to, and I promise you, I didn't have the slightest conception of the kind of a government we had with a master's degree and additional study at Berkeley. The National Tour Park Guide is quoting from the official literature, whereas John T. Flynn is telling the bare naked truth. What time is it? Five to eight. Five to eight. OK, we will go five more minutes, and then we'll take a rest. Something terrible is happening. We can't see what it is. It's out of sight, over the other side of this hill. It's awful. It's awful. Maybe, maybe it's a hijacking. Well, it's way worse than that. It's way worse than running a bomb or an airplane filled with bombs into a building. It's hijacking our history. Huh? What are you talking about? Well, that's the name of an article from the Reader's Digest, January of 1995, and it's still true. The article was true then, and it's still true. There is a hijacking going on, and they're hijacking our history. Go read the article, then debate with me. For the, you know, I don't want to come up and have a fisty cuffs about somebody's hijacking. Find out for yourself. Do your own homework. Here's an example that I think is worth reviewing. In 1945, a man to become famous named George Orwell wrote this book, 1984. In there, he has a character named Winston Smith and another named Julia. They are the two lead characters in the book. And the Ministry of Truth is this huge building in the background here. Now, this is a really worthwhile example. Now, Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth. This is Winston going to work with a briefcase. OK, Ministry of Truth's right over here. There we go, Ministry of Truth. And Winston Smith has a job assignment coming from Big Brother. Do you see Big Brother right up here in the corner on the wall? Big Brother is watching you. This is his assignment. This is the quotation out of George L. Orwell's writing. Rectify history to conform to party predictions, thus providing documentary evidence that the party is always correct. So we want the history book to support the political philosophy that is popular in the country today. Interesting, he looks like Joseph Stalin, doesn't he? He does, doesn't he? <laughs> Here's another quote from the same history book. This is part of the assignment, the job description of Winston Smith. Intentionally falsify history to achieve greater party control over the people. Really? Now, this is just nonsense written in 1945. You know, just a novel to make money, and he certainly did. Well, that's exactly what happened. History was changed intentionally to support the party philosophy, the politically correct <coughs> doctrine of the nationalist. Now, is there any evidence to back that? I wouldn't make the statement if I didn't have evidence. The Ministry of Truth had a slogan carved in the wall in stone. The slogan was, war is peace. Perpetual war for perpetual peace. Freedom is slavery. And the final slogan, ignorance is strength. Now, as nonsensical as that is, this was part of the story. This, would, this is what was going to happen in 1984. Winston said to Julia, do you realize that the past has been actually abolished? Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten. <coughs> Julia responds, I accept the party mythology. All the talk about party and politics is rubbish, so why let oneself be worried about it? I am not interested in the next generation, dear. I am interested in us, here and now. And Winston replies, the world view of the party has imposed itself successfully upon the people, and they are not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what has happened. Do you suppose that's a problem today? It doesn't look like it is in this room. Are we interested, that, interested enough in public events to try and find out what happened? You are, or you wouldn't be here. Then he goes into something called doublethink. 
the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. Ah, oh, you wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Have two contradictory beliefs in your mind at the same time and think they're both true? I started thinking, is there an example? Can I come up with a real example? Let's try this one. Who won World War II? I put the answer up there just in case there was a question. Who won World War II? We won. Now we all know that, don't we? What was the victory? And I had an old man on the front row one night. He came up afterwards, very kind to me, and he was all trembling. He'd been in the Second World War. And he says, we won. We beat that tyrant, Hitler. Real emotional about it, because he'd been there and fired upon and killed people. We won. What was the victory? We beat tyranny. Hitler, we won. Oh, really? Who's we? Who are we? We that won. Well, uh, the, the, that's the United States, the uh, United Kingdom, and uh, the USSR. That's Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. That's who won. Oh, really? Ah. Did World War II reduce or increase tyranny? Oh, it increased tyranny. And so you have just been guilty for the last 25 years of doublethink, Orwellian doublethink for you only 16 years. Oh, 18, okay. <laughs> Bad guess. William Tyler Page, undoubtedly a wonderful man, undoubtedly had wonderful motives. He wrote the American Creed. It was approved by Congress. I mean, what more could we have? Something approved by Congress must be right. And I thought, you know, I read through the American Creed and I thought, you have to be guilty of doublethink or you can't accept it. Try this. I believe in the United States of America, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed. A perfect union, one and inseparable. Can you have an inseparable union and still believe a United States has the right to govern, but be governed by the consent of the governed? What if one of the governed wants to withdraw their consent? You can't. You have to have Orwellian doublethink to accept this statement. Try another one. I believe in the United States of America, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states. Is this possible unless you're guilty of doublethink? You can't have it. It won't work. And tomorrow in the lesson on sovereignty, we'll give you the, the evidence in detail. You can't have this. Here's another double think. I believe in the United States of America, a democracy within a republic. Okay, you have to have double think to be able to handle this. Now, some evidence is hard to come by. An original source is sometimes impossible. And so you have to look at secondary sources and hope that they're quoting them accurately. And I read in the 5,000 year leap a quotation from this book. And I, I read it and I thought, I wonder if that's really true. I just, I can't, I can't believe it. it would be that, you know, obvious. And, and so finally I thought, I've got to see it in the original source. And so I went to the trouble to get the original source. And this is a photograph of it. Here, here was the trouble. I wanted to know if a certain quotation were true. So when I decided to find the original source, I was un unable to get it by any source other than going to the BYU Rare Books Library and ordering, ordering it in on interlibrary loan. It took several months for them to locate a copy of this booklet, and they brought it in. They called me and said, it's there. You know, it's here. Come and see it. Now, come and see it means you can't check it out. In fact, I got to the, uh, it was my first experience in that particular rare books library. And I got there, and they said, well, here is the book. And they wouldn't hand it to me yet until I stepped into a room where they could lock me in. Yeah, yeah. I went into a room, they locked the door behind me, and I now have this book in my hand. Whew. Actually, it was a, this is a newer one. We, we bought this later after we had this fun experience. But there in this locked room, I wasn't completely alone. It was kind of like Orwell's 1984. And Big Brother stood at the window and watched me read. <laughs> and I read the whole book. It took me several hours. I, it's not a very big book. It's only you know, 128 pages, something like that. I, I read this, this material and found it absolutely fascinating. In 1927, this was the citizenship training manual created by the War Department to train soldiers so they could go fight and they would know what they were fighting for. And this is what it said. And this is what it said. And this is what it said. 
The government of the United States is not a democracy, but a republic. Yeah. Really? really, isn't that unique? And then it went on to explain on page 102, what are the principal characteristics of a democracy? Demagogism, license, impulse, agitation, discontent, anarchy, chaos, and socialism. Yes, this is printed by the United States government in the government training manual in 1927. 52 years, no, not 52, 25 years later, the government came out with a new edition. The new edition is called The Soldier's Guide. Again, printed to teach soldiers what they're fighting for. And when you open the Soldier's Guide up to page 69, you read, because the United States is a democracy, the majority of the people decide how our government will be organized and run. The people do this by electing representatives, and these men and women then carry out the wishes of the people. Is that the kind of government our founding fathers established? They're going to carry out the wishes of the people? What if I wish for my neighbor's property? And there not, if there are enough of us wishing for our neighbor's property, then do our wishes get filled? Yep. And this kind of democracy they do? That's what democracy is. That's what's so good about it. Can you believe that contrast? I taught this lesson about a year ago in Cedar City, Utah. And one student in the back, he couldn't hardly believe it either. And so he said, a month or two later when he came and saw me, he said, I couldn't believe it. So I ordered the book in. I finally found it. I bought it. Oh, I said, how much did it cost? Oh, he said, I won't tell you. A rare book, hard to get, the 1927 edition. Well, it's there. It's real. I testify that it's real. I saw it in the real source. But that's not all. This is called evidence. By the way, this is the official literature, and that is evidence. It is Orwellian rectified history. Now, I'm going to use that word several times tonight. Orwellian. You won't forget what that means, will you? This is back to George Orwell's book and how Winston Smith was going to change the history to fit the party perspective and make it politically correct. That's Orwellian rectified history. So this is an example in the Army Training Manual of 1952 of Orwellian rectified history. When my friend Dave Miller was able to obtain the 1927 manual at great expense, he opened it up and out came this letter. Talk about a jam. This is evidence. From the War Department, March the 2nd, 1938. Apparently this lady, Mrs. Nina Duncan, had written asking for a Army training manual to go in the library in Madison, Wisconsin. And the War Department writes back and says, Dear Madam, I have your communication of February 26th with reference to obtaining a copy of the latest manual of citizenship training. In reply, you are advised that the manual of citizenship training is obsolete. This is evidence <laughs> that this is obsolete. Huh. That's why we don't have in the Alpine School District, a republic anymore, because that's obsolete. What do we have? A representative democracy. You know, half of you know about that, and the other half probably don't. I don't know what the, what the odds are. <laughs> anyway, this has been an interesting thing to follow. It's the truth that hurts. That's an old cliche we've all heard. And it's said this way in one man's book. This is a, a little cognitive dissonance. That means it's the truth that hurts but it's a nicer way to say it. It's the emotional stress felt when a person hears something that is true that does not agree with their cherished belief. So if you have believed something all your life to be true, and then someone shows you that it's false, it hurts. And I call this academic acupuncture. <laughs> yeah. Now this is, where the, this is where the teenagers got up and stomped out, okay? This is the slide I put on the screen. This is academic acupuncture of the worst form. The Citizenship in the Nation Merit Badge Training Handbook. A couple of years ago, four or five, I've never heard from them since. The Boy Scout leaders in my area said, we understand that you're a knowledgeable person on the Constitution. Would you please come and speak to our group of adult leaders and tell them about citizenship in the nation? 
Well, they were kind enough to bring me this manual the night before I was to speak. Well, I read one sentence, and the first sentence was false. Okay, that's all the further I got. One sentence. And so I started putting in what I call red flags. That's sticky, <laughs> sticky tabs. <laughs> I got red sticky tabs. Oh, they're nasty. And I put these red sticky tabs in. And by the time I got to page 38, that's all the pages there were. I had 18 sticky tabs in the book. That means either there is something false on the page or it is misleading because it doesn't tell the whole truth. Now, when I got done making that explanation before 15 adult scout leaders, you will have never seen such a sober audience with such straight mouths. They didn't want to hear another thing. I had not assessed my audience properly, and I came on too strong. I've never heard from them again. <laughs> so I put this slide on the screen. This happened about a month ago in Kanab, Utah. Four teenagers on the second row. I put this on the screen. The Supreme Court has the final authority to interpret the meaning of the Constitution and determine if the law is being applied correctly and fairly. I put that on the screen, and then I had the audacity to impose upon these people my own belief. This is false propaganda, I declared. And then one girl, she jumped from her chair right up out of the seat, and she said, heresy! <laughs> And she turned and she whispered to the other girls on the road, and they got up and marched out. That happened. It really did. Is that false propaganda? No. Absolutely. Do I have any evidence? Certainly, or I wouldn't say it's false. <laughs> Let me give you one tiny sample. Now, uh, an expert witness is not as good as good evidence, but an expert witness is helpful. If I call on, say, James Madison as an expert witness, might we give a little credibility, possibly that he's telling the truth? Possibly. Here's what he says about it. There can be no tribunal above the state. No tribunal such as the Supreme Court can be above the state's authority to decide in the last resort whether the compact made by them be violated. Oh my. You mean the states have an important role in determining the meaning of the Constitution? Out on the book, there's a there's a out on the book, out on the table, there's a book called Nullification by Thomas Woods. He'll give you the history of this and give you the background of why this position was taken. <coughs> well, the example, another example from this same manual fits into tonight's lesson also. The government the colonists established in the late 1700s has remained intact. That was the first sentence. You comfortable? Should we just go on? Has it remained intact? Well, certainly, Mr. Pratt. Don't we still have the Constitution? Yeah, it's on the wall back in Washington, I understand. I've never seen it there, but I think it is. I have a copy in my pocket here. Isn't the government intact? Well, let me give you an opposing viewpoint. OK, from a credible witness. Judge Robert Bork, he writes a book called Slouching Toward Gomorrah, Modern Liberalism and the American Decline. Obviously, obviously, he's not too happy with what's happened in the country. And in the book on page two, in the 2003 edition, he gives a report of the court case Lawrence versus Texas and then concludes, quoting from another prominent judge, two men's witness, the Constitution is simply gone. Now, he doesn't mean they had a big book burning and burned them all. They just don't follow it anymore. They just don't follow the Constitution. It has no limiting power on the Supreme Court. Just a minute now. Hang on. The government the colonists established in the late 1700s has remained intact. The Constitution is simply gone. Uh, don't these kind of contradict each other? Yeah, they do. Can they both be true? Not very easy. This is bare naked truth. The other one is the official literature. Some things are true whether you believe them or not. I have a specialty. It's old-fashioned printing. I should have clued you, but you recognize now that's an old-fashioned printing press, don't you? Have you ever, you've heard this before. A picture is worth a thousand words. Okay. Let's suppose that old-fashioned printing press represents a thousand words of history. It's the only time in your life you're ever going to read those thousand words. 
You read them in, you know, I don't care, high school class or somewhere else. You'll never see another story about that. What did you learn and how much of it is true and how much is false and what was omitted? If that picture is worth a thousand words, it hopefully is a good picture. Well, I want to testify to you as one of the world's, this is no joke, as one of the world's authorities on old-fashioned printing presses, <laughs> there aren't very many. This is a lousy picture. It's terrible. It isn't even hardly helpful to understand old-fashioned printing presses. Well, why? Well, let me give you an example. Right out here is supposed to be a great big platform called the carriage. It's not there. And right here is supposed to be a great big block of wood that fits around this square thing so that it changes rotary motion into linear motion. It's called the till. It's not there. It's just missing. See, many history books are like this. They omit things that you need to have to understand what really happened. But worse than that, this is terrible. It's the screw. The threads are going the wrong direction. It's all screwed up. <laughs> the story accepted uh -huh. by the public. That's it. That's the story accepted by the public. Five-sixths of the students in our high schools, according to Mr. Lewin, Professor Lewin, five-sixths of them, of them will never see another history book after they graduate. And that's the story they got. Parts missing, parts screwed up. What can we expect from them for supporting our American <laughs> principles of liberty? The missing carriage, the missing till, let's call that historical blackout. Now, I didn't invent that word. That's somebody else's historians call it that. When things are left out, it's historical blackout. And this screwed up screw, let's call that false propaganda. It's not just missing. It's worse than that. It's false. And they call it false propaganda. And when you combine historical blackout with false propaganda, you get historical brainwashing. Let's take an example of this. Let's say this missing carriage represents some important part of our American history that's missing, that we generally don't hear much about, not enough to make any sense out of it, or what we hear might be tainted and misguiding. Let's take, for example, and let this missing carriage represent the gigantic faction of 1861. Now, you're an unusual audience. I could probably call on any one of you, and you could come up and give a 10-minute talk on that topic. <laughs> well, five? Five minutes? Gary, you could do it, couldn't you? <laughs> you? You see, the problem now is I didn't know anything about the gigantic faction of 1861 until six years ago. Six years ago, somebody said to me, you really haven't learned much about that topic, have you? No, what topic do you mean? The one you don't know anything about? I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know, I can tell. Why don't you read this book? That friend said to me. And so I started reading about the gigantic faction. This is the book I read right here. That these are the first 17 books that I read. I read one book and I thought, that can't be real. That can't be real. That's not how it was. And I read another one and another one and another one. And after I read 17, I read 10 more. Carefully studied these books to try and grasp what really happened. It starts coming together like a puzzle. These pieces start to fit. I don't see the whole picture, but I can see better now what happened as I try to comprehend by study. Picture the faction of 1861. Here's one of the books up close. The American Union by James Spence. As I recall, he was a lawyer from England writing about American and the, America and the faction. He published it in 1862. Here was a great read. I, they're out on the table. There are blue covers out there. Abel Parker Upshur was Secretary of State following Daniel Webster. He was a renowned and respected attorney. He wrote, The True Nature and Character of Our Federal Government, a critical review of Joseph Story's commentaries on the Constitution. Well, you were taught they were wonderful, right? All you lawyers in the room, weren't you taught that Joseph Story's commentaries were one of the greatest commentaries ever written? Come on, Oak, weren't you? I wasn't, I'm not a lawyer, actually. Oh, thank goodness you weren't yeah. taught that then. This, this, is, this is his critical review of a book that lawyers today are told was wonderful. 
Hmm. Oh, he's not credible, is he? Just the undersecretary, not, not the under, he was the secretary of state, he was a renowned lawyer, he was a highly respected citizen. Too bad he got blown up when a cannon went off when he was on some ship doing a, a review of the military. That was his early demise. He actually wrote the book in 1840, but it was so fitting to describe what was about to happen that they published it in 1863. And it reveals the faction, the great faction of 1861. This is the best of any that I've read. There are three of them left on the table. And they're a different color, but their title is The Republic of Republics. And we'll spend a whole hour and a half on that tomorrow, on that topic. 1878, Bernard Jannon Sage. I'd like to stop and spend 10 minutes telling you about Santa Sage. He was a great guy. His pen name was P.C. Sense. That stood for Plain Common Sense. <laughs> and his book is Plain Common Sense. It, I say, is the best describing the great faction of 1861. Here's another great read. Is Davis a traitor? This man was a mathematics professor following the war between the states. He writes, secession as a constitutional right prior to the War of 1861. Albert Taylor Bledsoe, good reading. Here, more modern, there are hundreds of books on the subject. I read 29, and then I quit counting. Lincoln, The Road to War by Frank Vander Linden, excellent read. Lincoln's Wrath, excellent read. Lincoln Unmasked, excellent read. Here's a good summary of what we were to face. This is written by a Union officer in 1887. By the way, I read this in a book by a man named uh, George Edmonds. And then in the fine print in the modern edition of it, it says, George Edmonds was really a woman named M Elizabeth Merriweather. But when she published this, it wasn't going to be read by people because they didn't like women writing books like this. Isn't that terrible? And so they had, she had to put a man's name on her book. She quotes from a Union officer, and he says, the true story of the late war has not been told. It probably never will be told. It is not flattering to our people. Unpalatable truths seldom find their way into history. Well, that's true. Uh-oh, here we go. We're going to take this missing till. Remember, that it's supposed to be there, but it's not. A great big, huge block of wood supposed to be this thick all the way around this square object. It is not there. It's missing. Let's let that represent the great gold heist of 1933. Do you think it would be important for our children to know about the greatest gold robbery ever to take place in the history of the world? 700 million ounces of gold swindled and taken from the people? Would that be interesting? What effect does that have on our economy today? Hmm. You mean this economic chaos that we're in now is affected by the great gold heist of 1933? It surely is. Maybe we should teach about it. You can learn about it if you're interested. By the way, this is a photograph, an actual photograph. Not often do we get a photograph of the swindlers stealing the gold. Photograph, gold being stolen. The chief ringleader, the chief swindler is this man. Hmm, he looks vaguely familiar, doesn't he? We'll learn more about him later. You can read about this in various publications. Probably they're out on the table. Great Miz of the Great Depression. Empire of Debt, I love this book. It was just great, great reading. The Money Masters, DVD. What has government done to our money? Excellent read, it's out on the table. This is the newest thing, it's out on the table. Good material, you can learn it if you want to. You can know about these things if you're interested in finding out. <coughs> what should we do? Remember that question early in the lesson? What was the answer? Find out who you are and where you come from as a people. George Santayana. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Close your eyes for just a moment. OK, you're OK. <laughs> OK, you know what you missed. That's where the intermission was. <laughs> What are we going to let this represent? This is terrible. This is false propaganda. It's just not true. How about we, will, we let that represent the supreme fraud of 1945? You mean there was a supreme fraud went on then? Wouldn't it be important to know if there was a supreme fraud, what it was? 
I submit for your consideration that the evidence clearly supports what I'm about to show you a picture of as the supreme fraud. This is the supreme fraud of 1945. By the way, that's the front cover of my own pocket edition. The last time I had an audience, a week ago, and I asked them, how many of you have ever read the United Nations Charter? Let's try it right here. How many have ever read the United Nations Charter? <coughs> Thank you, sir. One hand. The supreme fraud of 1945, and we don't even know what it's about, and we're not taught it in school, except in Texas. And I'm not sure they've got it right there, but at least they were hoping to rewrite that part of history. The supreme fraud. Let me give you a little tiny bit of evidence to stir your brain cells. I was sitting at my, oh, not far from here. I lived up here on, by, by the, uh, in Manila, or by the old Manila church. Some of you know where I mean, up by Joe Ferguson. I was sitting there listening to the radio one night, and the President of the United States came on the air. And the announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, it was January the 16th, 1991. We have before us the opportunity to forge a new world order, to fulfill the promise and vision of the United Nations founders. And he went on. I, I, was, I was so shocked, I jumped out of my chair and bumped my head on the ceiling. I couldn't believe, what did he just say? We're gonna have a new world order and we're gonna do what the United Nations wants us to do and we're gonna fulfill the promise of the founders of the United Nations? Why would that upset me? because I had done my homework and I knew who they were and what their vision was. Let me give you a tiny little introduction to it. Who were the founders of the United Nations? Now, if we're gonna fulfill the vision of the founders, we ought to really know who they were, shouldn't we? Shouldn't we know something about them? How many know the founders of the United States? Name one of the United States, you know, our founding fathers, who's one? And name another one. Keep naming them. Yeah. Good, good. You could name a whole list. You could come up with a list this long of the founders of the country that we live in. But who can name a single founder of the United Nations? One hand. Name one. Um, FDR is one. He wasn't there. He doesn't count. Thank you. Alger Hiss. Dr. Everett from Australia. Oh. <laughs> I would never have gotten that one. <laughs> I can't correct you, but you're probably right. <laughs> Was he, was he there? He was, the, the first he was one of yeah, them. Okay. Well, there, there are founders, and they had a vision, but who were they and what was their vision? Well, let me introduce you to a few of them. This man right here was the chief diplomat from the United States. He was elected as the Secretary General of the San Francisco Convention. His name was Alger Hiss. Only three years would pass by, and we would discover he was working for the communist. Yeah. Oh, well. You know, just one, we had other diplomats, maybe they were good guys, yes, we had at least 18 more. Who do you think they were working for? Same group. That's 18 diplomats from the United States of America working for the communists as they were sent to San Francisco to write the United Nations Charter. Oh, but that was not all. Who else was sending, by the way, these are some of the guys I, I just looked their faces up recently. I took their names and Googled their faces, and almost every one of them has with their, their description, spy. <laughs> they were all spies. They were our diplomats. They were drafting and creating the United Nations Charter. The supreme fraud of 1945. There are more of them there. What was their vision? It certainly wasn't the freedom we want to have. <laughs> Oh, but they weren't the only ones sent to the United Nations. This man also sent diplomats. He sent a whole contingent. Who is he? Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe Stalin. And who is he sending? One of his top henchmen, V.M. Molotov. Now, V.M. Molotov took a whole group from the Soviet Union. These are founders of the United Nations. These are the ones that were going to now embrace the doctrines and the things they taught. Well, here they are. Here's V.M. right here in the middle. All of these people around him are the contingency from the Soviet Union. These are the newsmen interviewing them. Yes, V.M. Molotov, Soviet delegation. What was their vision? <coughs> hmm. Do you think that would be important if we taught that in public school? What their vision was? I should think so. Do you suppose that's in the textbook on democracy? No, not there. 
called historical blackout. We have mock United Nations competitions in our schools. Thank you. Instead, instead of revealing the exposing the villains for what they are, we have mock United Nations competitions and love the organization. We're getting to that also. Thank you for bringing it up. Well, here we have the head delegate from America, and here we have V.M. Molotov sitting to his right hand as they guide and direct and create the United Nations Charter. Is this of any interest to any American? Should be. Rule of force versus rule of law. Two contending forces is what we now have. Two contending documents. This grand old hero from Utah, he declared, about the same time George Orwell wrote 1984, the United Nations Charter is a war document, not a peace document. Perpetual war for perpetual peace. We have never had peace in the world since the United Nations was created. All of the battles that we have fought, all of the battles the United States has gone to have never been a war since the United Nations was created. What have they been? Police, action. Police actions. And who was the one that directed us to go into them? The United Nations, not Congress. We've never declared war since the United Nations was invented. Well, this is a great relief to me. As a historic person loving printing presses, I am relieved to see this press has a carriage. It has a carriage and it has a till. That's the till right there. Oh, that's a great job. Man, I'm so glad. See, as we reproduce old-fashioned printing presses, we have to study this kind of material. See, this is evidence. This is the only evidence in many cases that we'll find is a wood engraving done 400 years ago. And thank God for those men that did that. Even the bad one has some value. You know, the one that's really screwed up. But here we have the, the carriage and we have the till. But there is something very fascinating in this one. It's this little cherub. They've added a cherub. A cherub in front of the screw. Now look really close. Do you see any problems with the screw? It's still backwards. It's still screwed up. But they have a cherub in front of it, and it's not so easy to see. So as I read this and studied this, I thought, this represents false propaganda, this screw that's backwards. Historical whitewashing is the cherub. OK, we, we try to hide it. We're trying to hide the false propaganda. Now, I'm sure that's not why the artist did this when they drew the picture, but that's what it does for me. I think they should do this. They should put this warning. The government ought to put it. They put it on, what on? Cigarettes? They ought to put it on other thing. Warning, when studying history, look for the cherub in front of the screw. We could probably get that passed, couldn't we? <laughs> this is the cherub right here. This is the cherub. In the United Nations Reform Act of 2005, House Resolution 2745, it says, quote, the lofty goals of the United Nations as reported by Tom DeLay, prevent war, protect human rights, and advance the cause of human freedom. That's the cherub. Wasn't he a Texas Republican? This is the best, this is the best artist rendition of a printing press I have ever seen. I mean, I've studied them all, literally. I don't think there is an old-fashioned printing press picture I haven't studied. As I, I taught book history at Texas A&M for seven years, every year for a week, I'd go down and teach book history. You've got to be on your toes for college students. This is a beautiful example of a printing press drawing. He has taken all of the parts that were significant and laid them out on the floor so that you can see what they look like out of the press. He has numbered them so you can see where they fit into the press. It is outstanding creation of good history. And I say to myself, this is the bare naked truth. It can be done. Good books can be written. Good art can be created. The front cover of Lowen's book, The Lies My Teachers Told Me, has a can of whitewash sitting on the history book. If we go into the text, we read on page four, startling airs of omission and distortion mar American histories. OK? Omission and distortion. Whitewashing, one of the problems. Our teachers and our textbooks leave out most of what we need to know 
about the American past. Blackout, they leave it out. Traditional high school narrative history book textbooks actually make students stupid. <laughs> now this is a history professor writing the book. He's just finished reviewing 12 history books and he read the whole book this first time, second time he didn't. And he says it makes them stupid. They're gonna leave the classroom with less understanding of history than when they came in. That's called brainwashing in American history. Let's take an example of brainwashing. Are you having fun yet? You're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to relax and enjoy this. I'm having fun. The main crisis of 1898. Now, any one of these things we throw on the screen is good for a week's you know, discussion and reading, but we're just tantalizing your brain cells, getting you interested in the topic. Maybe you'll go do your own homework. In 1898, there was a ship called the Maine in Cuba, in the harbor of Cuba, and it blew up mysteriously. And then, as soon as they could create the newspaper, they wrote about it. Main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo was the headline. Now, have you ever walked by the newsstand and all you read is the headline? You don't reach and put your dollar in or your quarter and get the newspaper and read the story, do you? You just read the headline. Why are you saying, boy, and you get home and you tell your wife, I read the headline today and the main explosion was caused by a bomb or a torpedo. But in the fine print inside it says, we really don't know how it was caused. <laughs> uh, maybe it was a bomb, but we don't know. They did admit that in the fine print. But needless to say, the American public embraced the first cover page and they were in a furor Something must be done. Justice must take place. It was Spain. Those naughty people from Spain sent a bomb or a torpedo and just, okay, we'll declare, and they did. So we declared war on Spain. What for? Because maybe a bomb or a torpedo blew up the main. And that was the reason we started this war. This is false propaganda. It's just pure nonsense. They found out a few years later when they examined closely that the boat, boat blew up because of an internal explosion, like maybe coal dust ignited and blew up. It had nothing to do with Spain. But we wanted a war. We wanted to go trounce on Spain. We wanted to conquer because President McKinley, he wanted to have an empire, a world empire. This is interesting history. Oh, this is a new quote. Somebody tell me who said that. I can't remember. One person say it. Rom Emmanuel. Never let a good crisis pass by without exploiting it. Well, this is a standard routine for government, especially ours. Never let a good crisis pass by. Just look at all the crises and see what they've done. Well, they didn't let that one pass by. Here William McKinley is, fitting Uncle Sam, a great big obese Uncle Sam. He's fitting him out with bigger clothes so we can have a bigger empire. This is a 1900 political caricature. Oh dear, here's the screw and the cherub in front of it. Beware of false propaganda. Look for the cherub in front of the screw. Okay, that's what you're gonna be thinking when you go home tonight. When I read a book, when I listen to a, 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 a presentation like mine, look for the cherub in front of the screw. That's so unusual that you might actually remember it. Okay, this is the cherub. That's the cherub, McKinley. He says to the American people, the American purpose is to prepare the islands for independence. That sounds great and noble, doesn't it? Boy, we're going to go down there and help those poor people, and we're going to prepare them for independence. That was the chair. This is the screw. Who are these people? Oh, they're the people we're preparing for independence. Well, where are they? Oh, they're in a concentration camp. They weren't too cooperative when we came to prepare them. They didn't want to be prepared. So we had to lock them up, those that we didn't kill. Huh, well, OK. Filipino concentration camp, 1900. This is the screw. Take another example. The American military, this is a quotation from a textbook. The Ameri it's got to be true. <laughs> a quotation from a textbook, it must be true. There's not a person in here that believes that, are you? No. Anyway, it says, it claims, the American military effort became more systematically vicious and brutal. That's the screw. Okay, we were treating these people abusively. Oh, I just read, I'll get to it in a moment, just I read it yesterday. This is the cherub, the American president announces 
the American people entrenched in freedom, and that is spelled correctly according to the old book, the American people entrenched in freedom take their love for it wherever they go. <coughs> and so we were taking our love for freedom to the Philippines. Now it started in Cuba with the Maine, the sinking of the Maine, and now we're clear on the other side of the ocean sinking the Philippines. That's the cherub. This is the screw. Clear on the other side of the Pacific. I didn't even know where the Philippines were until I read this book. Honest, nobody taught me that in high school. I find out the Philippines are clear over by China, just south of Japan. What are we doing over there, beating those people up? Oh, we're taking them freedom, is what the history book says. In the Philippines, the commander in chief, President McKinley, way over here, he has sent the commission to these guys to whoop them and beat them until they sub subdue themselves and they're, and they're our subjects. And this commander is quoted as saying, shoot everyone over the age of 10. The more you kill and burn, the better it will please me. Okay, we're gonna subdue the Filipinos, no matter what it takes. Now, I read three different accounts of this event. Probably I read more than that. I'm gonna quote from three. The official literature, the high school history book says, and we killed, slaughtered, more than 50,000. Mm. Now you get out of the high school history book into another history book and they declare, and we slaughtered more than 200,000. You see, this high school students can't take it as easily. You've got to have a lower number. And then there's one other history book that declares one out of every eight Filipinos were killed. Now, in addition to killing them, we burned their homes and ruined their crops as we caused them to bow in submission to the United States. Hmm. What were we doing over there? Preparing them for freedom. That was the cherub. This was the screw. Back you can read more about this in various books. Always read them thinking, is part of this tainted? What can I trust? What is valuable? I enjoyed this book. <coughs> the Sorrows of Empire, Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic by Chalmers Johnson, published in 2004. On page 43, yes, page 43, he quotes Senator Albert Beveridge. Now, I just yesterday said to myself, I want to know if that quote is in context. I want to see what the original speech said. We have this wonderful medium now. We live in the day that they call the information age, and I've only recently got into it. Like a month or so ago, I got a computer with an internet. Wow. <laughs> and I typed in Senator Albert Beveridge. I hit the key, and zippo, there the whole speech was. And the opening statement was the opening statement of his speech. Wherever I had it here, I don't know if I lost it already. Where'd it go? Oh, we haven't quoted it yet. Senator Albert v Beveridge was in support of the American Empire, and he gave a speech that when I finished reading it, I was like, what was that king back in the old days when uh, Paul stood before him, King Agrippa? Was that the king that says something like, uh, thou almost hast converted me, or something like that? <laughs> I read this statement, and I thought, wow, he's almost got me converted. We should send all of our sons to the Philippines to kill people. Oh, it was a great speech. Here's what he started out by saying. The Philippines are ours forever. And just beyond the Philippines are China's illimitable markets. The Pacific Ocean is ours. The Philippines are the stepping stones to China. Conquer the Philippines. But he said it in such a wonderful way that it was very convincing. And so Congress, the Senate, supported him. And they went and finished the job bit of history I haven't read yet. Well, here's an interesting picture. I love Norman Rockwell paintings. I love my calendar. My wife makes me get from farm, state farm insurance every year. Norman Rockwell on every page all year long. This is the beautiful picture of the soldiers. All of the wars America has ever entered are depicted on this screen. All of them. All of the wars. What's the newest war? What's this represent right here? No, <laughs> Afghanistan. Would you believe the Second World War? All of the wars we've ever entered are depicted here, and the, <coughs> the, new, the newest one is the Second World War, because after that, we never had a war again. All we had was police actions entered into by in cooperation with the United Nations. So I really enjoy this artwork. Here's the First World War, Spanish-American War, and Civil War, and 
on back down through the different wars we had, clear back to the Revolutionary War. Why do men go to war? Why don't women go to war? Why don't we send women instead of men? <coughs> There's a book called Why Do Men Go to War? I read it. It was good, good reading. The first causality of war is the truth. So when we start reading about war, always question whether it's true. When you see the newsreels, when you see anything about the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, anything about anything that's going on in the world, question it. The side that wins the war writes the history. So whenever a side wins a war, they're going to put some good reason out why that war was valuable and important and why all those good people died. And they're going to justify it with every possible thing they can come up with. This will happen. This book is the side that lost the war. I just put this slide in this morning. I thought, you know, I've thrown a lot of si the, the pictures up. Let's put one on the side that lost the war. They have an opinion also. They're credible historians also. This man's fully qualified to write a book on the period in which he lived through. The man, Oren Milo Roberts, why he was uh, a United States congressman that they wouldn't seat. That means when the South elected congressmen during the Reconstruction period, the, the northern, Northerners wouldn't allow them to come. So he was a congressman that was never seated in Congress. He served as a successful attorney for many years. They then elected him to the Supreme Court of the state of Texas. He was the chief justice for four years. And then he served two terms as governor. Now, does he have any background to write on this subject? I would think so. I felt he was an honest historian writing a good text. That gives you an example of another viewpoint from a side that didn't win the war. And it'll be refreshing if you've never done such an experiment, experience or experiment. Read the other viewpoint from the side that lost. Here's a book that's very valuable. I enjoyed it th thoroughly. Thomas Fleming. It's a modern book. I don't remember the year, but 10 or 12 years ago. He calls this, it's about the First World War, the illusion. The illusion of victory? I thought we won. Did we win the Second World War? <laughs> did, we, did we conquer tyranny? Hmm. Did we win the First World War? We thought we did. He doesn't think we did. Professor Fleming does not think we did. So he writes The Illusion of Victory. Now, I think you can tell me who this is. It's Woodrow Wilson. He was the president during this time period. And you all know the famous statement about democracy. What did he say about democracy? We're going to make the world safe for democracy. Isn't that great? Yeah. Going to make the world safe for socialism. You see, he was the one that believed in socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. That's back in the old evidence there. Make the world safe for democracy. Also, he said, we're going to fight a war to end all wars. Well, we'll never have a war again. If you just send your boys over there and let them be slaughtered in the trenches of Belgium and France, we'll never have to fight again. And then he also said, we're going to fight a war without hate. Yeah, isn't that great? Now, these are all famous quotations from Woodrow Wilson. Here's the first hate poster they put up. As soon as he got the support of the American people, they started soliciting their money. And here we have the Marine. He's going to halt the Hun. This is the Hun abusing this woman. Now, what's a Hun? It's a German. It's not just a German. You look at the definition up used in that time period, any savage or destructive person, a term of contempt applied to German soldiers in World War I. We're going to halt those contemptible, despicable German soldiers. Were they really contemptible and despicable, those soldiers? Not any more than ours. Have you ever heard the Christmas truce of 1914? What an inspiring story. Those soldiers weren't any different than our soldiers, just fathers and husbands and boyfriends and sons forced by their government to go out and confront an enemy and be shot and to shoot. President Wilson hired George Creel as a propaganda specialist. George Creel's assignment was to convert the American people into a white hot heat in support of sending their sons to fight in the First World War. We want them to have a fervor and an excitement and a love to go over and be engaged in those fr freezing trenches and being killed. George Creel made movies. 
propaganda movies. Third United States official war picture under four flags, prepared by the Division of Films Committee of Public Information, George Creel, director. <laughs> but that wasn't his most successful thing. His most successful thing was short talks by Four Minute Man. Four Minute Man were employed as volunteers across the country. And by the end of his assignment, he had 75,000 volunteers giving speeches all over the United States. They spoke to millions upon millions of audiences. More population than we even had. That means you had to hear it more than once. <laughs> they, they estimate that they addressed more than 314 million people. Only had a population of a million or so at that time. So everybody got to hear the speeches several times. What was their speeches? Oh, they would say, they would go to the theater owner, for example. You know, I give a short talk while the man's changing the films on the double feature. It takes four minutes to change the films. That's why they came up with the four minute man. So he only wanted four minutes. And so he says, I just want to talk for four minutes. I have a, pres a message from the President of the United States. Oh, certainly, certainly. Patriotic, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Then he'd get up in front of the audience and he would give this dramatic propaganda spiel to convince you to send your brothers and sons and husbands to war. Hmm. Nine and a half million men went peacefully and volunteered for the draft. It was so successful. This is part of our history we don't generally talk about. It was such a terrible thing, all the lies that were going on, that Arthur Poinsonby wrote a book about it. Falsehood in Wartime, Propaganda Lies of the First World War. Henry Ford declared, history is bunk, as all the propaganda was put, and they called it history. Now, I want to suggest these two books. Read them both, at least read half of them, at least read a chapter, <laughs> and compare. Particularly, pages 168 to 190 in this one, and compare that with pages 295 to 310 in that one. They're both written by lawyers, not too far apart, both very highly respected lawyers. Uh, William Rawl, he was, he was uh, invited by President George Washington to be the Attorney General of the United States. He declined, said he preferred to stay at home and do his law practice in Philadelphia. But William Rawl was a highly respected attorney. He wrote this law textbook, A View of the Constitution, published it in 1825. It was used at West Point and other schools of higher learning. It was republished in 1829. They continued using it. I was so fascinated to read what he had to say in chapter 32. 15 pages. It was really good reading. Contrast that to the pages over here, pages 168 to 190, by another well-respected and beloved lawyer, Abraham Lincoln. Read the two, lay them side by side, and then ask yourself, is one of these Orwellian rectified history? Hmm. Take another example. I read them carefully, cover to cover, studied intensely the content of these two books. Roosevelt's Road to Russia, FDR and the Creation of the United Nations. And then I ask you the question, is one of these Orwellian rectified history? Here's another one. This is a high school history book. This one weighs 5.3 pounds. That's a thousand, oh, I was earlier wrong. I said 88, it's 87. 1,087 pages. And on page 418, it says, the Morrell Tariff Act of 1861 moderately increased duties. Moderately. Remember that word, moderately. And that's all they said about the Morrell Tariff Act and went on to other things. This book is like the one we quoted from earlier. Its desire is to promote the nationalist concept, the nationalist agenda. And so the Morrell Tariff Act wasn't very important when the author wrote that page. There was no shortage of space. He surely could have added another paragraph or sentence or two to clarify the Morrell Tariff Act. He did not. It's blackout, historical blackout. Let's go to a tax historian, Charles Adams. He's a highly respected, noted tax historian. He's a, a lawyer that specialized in taxes and tax law. He writes this excellent book. They're out on the table. It's good. It's the best short version of the gigantic faction of 1861 that I've ever read. It's a little short version, just bigger than the Reader's Digest. He says, 
Some history is helpful to understand the forces that brought forth the ultra high Morrill Tariff Act in uh, the Morrill Tariff in early 1861. Just a minute, what do you call that? Ultra high? It was the highest tariff in history with rates for iron products of over 50%, rates for clothing run over 25%. It was a major plank in the Republican platform. Oh, just a minute now. What did these guys say? And what did they just brush off? Oh, it was moderately, the Morrell Tariff Act moderately increased. Huh? Just a minute. What did this guy call it? The highest tax in history, the major plank of the Republican Party platform? I think somebody's not telling the truth here. There's another book that's, I think it's out on the table also. I dearly enjoy John Denson. He's a, a judge right now serving back in the East Coast in a courtroom. A Century of War. The most important cause. The most, imp the most important. You think the Morial Tariff was a significant tariff? This man says the most important cause of the American Civil War goes all the way back to the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and the dispute over the tariff between Mason and Madison. We'll cover that in more detail tomorrow. What? That was significant? The dispute in 1816, 18, get the right year, 1787? Books may have value. This guy did a great amount of effort. Robert Stinnett published his book in 2000, Day of Deceit, The Truth About FDR and Pearl Harbor. Wouldn't it be nice to know the truth? Boy, I tell you, there's a lot of myth out there on this topic. Hundreds upon hundreds of books on Pearl Harbor. Which one's trustworthy? Which one is Orwellian history? This book, this book right here, the man, he, was, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't at Pearl Harbor, but he served in the Navy just shortly after Pearl Harbor. So he's an older gentleman, probably dead by now. Uh, he became a journalist later in life, and about 17 years before he published, he began studying and, and researching the content for this book. He went through the Freedom of Information Act and found hundreds, he says thousands, of documents that were not available prior to his effort through the Freedom of Information Act. He studied those documents. He could not get his hands on many because they said they're still classified. National security would be bothered, you know, corrupted if we let those documents out. Sixty years after Pearl Harbor, we can't know the story because the documents are still classified. Nevertheless, he got enough documents and he photocopied them and he put them into this book and his narrative is extremely convincing. Hmm, what's he trying to convince us of? This book contains direct evidence, that's photographic copies of FDR's involvement and foreknowledge, foreknowledge, foreknowledge of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Hmm, huh, really? I told this to my dad one night and he says, well, if that's true, son, that makes FDR a murderer. Yeah, if that's true, that's just exactly what it makes him. This man has laid enough evidence out that it's pretty hard to say, uh, it's not true. Huh. That's not all. Fleming, another book by the same author I respect highly, he writes The New Dealer's War, and he lays out, not about Pearl Harbor, he lays out other choices that President Roosevelt made that were poor choices. Very bad choices. I remember it was during the reading of that book, I kept seeing this one three-letter word keep cropping up. Every, every few pages, another three-letter word. What was that word? Starts with an L. Lie. Lie. He continuously lied to the people. He'd come out on his radio programs and he'd lie to the people. And the evidence is laid out carefully in this book when he did it and what he said. And now we know it was a lie. It was about then I remembered reading about the ABCs, you know. Roosevelt had all sorts of programs, the CCC and the ABC and the FFS and whatever they were. And I thought, you know, he was guilty of the PPP. In fact, the PPP, PPP, the eight P's. Philanderer, perpetual prevaricator, plus power piling pompous politician. That was the real Roosevelt. Here's another one. FDR's folly, again about the choices President Roosevelt made during his service as president, how Roosevelt and his New Deal prolonged the Great Depression. See, the official literature says it's shortened the Great Depression. We were blessed by his great decisions shortening the Depression. No, it was the other way around. The truth is probably closer in this one. 
So you take these three books, put them together, and you have 1,350 pages presenting evidence of poor choices. Contrast that to this Utah history book. And I was, I was sent a copy by the publisher. I used to read history books, and the publishers respected me enough. I got a copy from the publisher and asked for my opinion. And after I sent my opinion in, they sent me a letter and said, may we publish your name in the front of our book as one who has read the book. And I wrote back and said, no, not unless you put in my changes. <laughs> my name's not in the book. Here's what it says. Get ready for this. This is a Utah history book. President Franklin Roosevelt died very suddenly. Now, that's a complete lie right there. President Franklin Roosevelt died very suddenly this afternoon. A terrible blow to the United States and the peace-loving people of all the world. My heart is full of sorrow in the passing of this great man. Man, tearjerker, isn't it? Is there any truth in that? Well, you don't know. You don't know who other, whether one book's telling the truth or the other book's telling the truth. How do you know? Richard Holtzoffel is a beloved, highly respected Utah historian. Maybe he's here tonight. Richard? <laughs> Not here. He's on a mission, I think. It probably is. I say, don't, don't judge the people by the books they write. He's not old enough to have said that at the time himself. He's just quoting. He's the apothecary, taking from the bottles, mixing the liquids together, and stirring them and making a new book. I don't know who he's quoting, but the official literature says this all the time. This is just official literature. He says who he's quoting here. On page 252, he's quoting from a letter from someone who wrote and said these things. But he's obviously presenting this to try and help you get an understanding of the president during that time period. And if you read his book in the seventh grade, this was a seventh grade history book. If you read his book in the seventh grade and you read nothing else after that, you will always have this wonderful endearment to this great hero. Well, maybe that's just not the right perspective. Let's look at the evidence. So here we have more quotations from the same book, pages 218 to 252. I'm giving you two contending viewpoints. I'm causing your brain cells to stir. Yours are stirring, aren't they, Jim? Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> I'm glad to see you tonight. <laughs> OK. Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal brought relief to millions. These are the things that he's teaching you during, during these pages. On September 7, 1941, there was a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, does, that, does Robert Stinnett's book say there was a surprise attack? No, he spends four or 500 pages laying out evidence showing it was not a surprise attack. So this is a con contradiction here. Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats kept the people informed of the war's progress. Did Thomas Fleming say those fireside chats were valuable? No, he said they contained many lies. And then one more point this author makes, Franklin Roosevelt was a great man of peace. Really. Alan Stang sums up what these three books teach in detail with evidence. He sums it up in one sentence. On February the 1st, 2008, he wrote, by the way, who's Alan Stang? He's a credible historian. He's a national best-selling author. And he writes, liar, swindler, thief, traitor, and mass murderer, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Come on, somebody leap up and say, heresy! <laughs> and run out. <laughs> do it, do it. What's the truth? Do you see the challenge as you read books? You're challenged with this. If you don't read books, you're not challenged. You can live peacefully. <laughs> Compare these two, these two statements. Well, this is the summary of 1,350 pages of evidence. This is a Utah history book. Is one of these Orwellian rectified history? Revisionist. I, I used to be taught revisionists were terrible. Revisionists write bad things. They change things. They make George Washington look like a villain and Thomas Jefferson look like a skunk. And you, you've heard this, haven't you? I always thought, boy, revisionists, we ought to hang all the revisionists. There ought to be a law passed. Everybody that's a revisionist historian must be hung by age 23. That's not true. I read a book by a revisionist. Some of them ought to be hung, but not all of them. This man, can't really see it up there, it says Revisionism, A Key to Peace by Harry Elmer Barnes. One thing I really liked about this book was only 69 pages. 
He says revisionism is bringing history into accord with the facts. So if a history book hasn't got it together, maybe some new evidence will help the future historians to correct that. This is often the case. It was not until Robert Stinnett went to all the effort to create the evidence and put, not created, but to put the evidence in a book that finally we now understand better what happened in the Second World War. So revisionism has a place, bringing history into accord with the facts. This book, oh, this book is a classic. I love it. I love it. Besides that, it's got the name of a book I helped to create. Have any of you ever heard of The Making of America by W. Cleon Skousen? You have it? I'm proud to say I helped participate in creating it. You'll see my name in the front. This book has the same name but a different subtitle. That's why they you know, can do it. So it's the, the Making of America, The History of the United States from 1492 to the Present, published in 2002, so that's pretty current. This book is, I love it because it has such good examples of whitewashing, brainwashing, and blackout, and propaganda, all contained in this one beautiful book, nicely done. It's so beautifully done, I thought they ought to change the name to The Mythology of America. <laughs> but they probably won't. And in the front, it's only 200 and some pages. They have a page of Forward by Laura Bush. Now, this is a prestigious book. Now, you have First Lady Laura Bush endorsing the book with an entire page of endorsement on the quality of material that you're about to see. Can't you just, you just want to rush out and buy this, don't you? I gave one as a gift one night in front of an audience like this. We had several gifts to give out that night, and we had a history teacher that took the entire class, came to every lesson, a whole bunch in the series, and at the end, we gave the history teacher a copy of this book because it contained the best examples of historical blackout, propaganda, and so forth. It was all just for fun, you know. In this book, Professor, what's his name? Prof Professor Johnston, notice he's, he's not ashamed of his titles, historian Robert D. Johnston, PhD, okay? He proudly announces in his foreword, quote, Jocelyn Lindsay was the best fact checker I have ever dealt with, going beyond extremely careful attention to the accuracy of the information. I've never seen a book give a credit to the fact checker before. This book had a fact checker who got high honor from her boss. Okay? I'm going to take you into the book now. It's only 240 pages, and it covers history from 1492 to the year 2002. How much space should we allow for Joseph McCarthy? Well, at least a page and a half. And that's what he did. A page and a half to badmouth and slander and put down Joseph McCarthy. In 2002? Wake up, Mr. Johnston. We already know that McCarthy didn't do all those nasty things they've been saying he did. Why don't you put the truth in your book like Texas claimed they're going to do in theirs? No, he had to spend a page and a half badmouthing McCarthy and finally concluded Quote, McCarthy had no names of communists in the State Department or anywhere else. McCarthy's conspiracy didn't exist, and he knew it. That's pretty strong language, isn't it, Arlen? Yeah. That's like saying McCarthy was a liar. He was a liar, and he knew it. Really? <laughs> wow. What's the truth? Was there any evidence? Was there is there today any evidence that there were communists? Was there before 2002 any evidence there were communists in the State Department? Was there a conspiracy? Well, just a minute. Didn't we read about in 1945 the United States sent a whole bunch of people to the San Francisco Convention, and how many of them do we now know were participating on the enemy side? How many? I gave you a number. Yeah, at least 18. We might not know all of them. Well... McCarthy knew that, but he didn't know all of it. You know, he used, to be, he used to be accused of saying McCarthy was such a terrible senator, he used to say there was a communist under every bush, or, or else there was a communist under every bed. You've heard those kind of statements probably, have you? Well, the truth is there were two. Two under every bush and two under, he was wrong. McCarthy was wrong. He didn't have his numbers near high enough. What is history? What we just viewed here is the story accepted by the public. That's why this book is so beautiful. You'd, you'd uh, start off talking about the uh, making of America by Cleon Skousen, but this one 
there's, there's two, two books. There are two separate books. Is that what you want? There are two separate books. This is not the one by Cleon Skousen. <laughs> I'm giving you two separate books with the same name. There are two contending forces, and I can assure you the book I helped to create wasn't anything like this. <laughs> anyway, it's a great read to give you examples of how history can be presented. It is the story accepted by the public. Now, if we go to other sources and get evidence, this is one source of evidence, the Venona Secrets, published in 2000, two years before Johnston published his book. In 1995, the Venona documents finally became available to American historians. Well, what were the Venona documents? Who, who made them available? Who was our friend to provide us the information that there were communists in the State Department? Uh, none less than Mikhail Gorbachev. Huh? It was in, that, in the period that we call Glasnost and Perestroika. Do you remember those words? And Gorbachev announced, we have to have more openness and sharing. And so he said, I'll open up some of the files over here if you'll open up some of yours. We can share. So what did he share? Well, he shared the Venona papers, among other things. And in the Venona papers, we found out who the communists were in the State Department and how many. Included in the Venona secrets are the details of spying activities that reached from Harry Hopkins in the White House. He lived with Franklin Roosevelt in the White House. Harry Hopkins in the White House, to Alger Hiss in the State Department, to Harry Dexter White in the Treasury, plus many more. How many more? This man tells it in his book. By count from the Venona decrypts, there were 329 Soviet agents inside the U.S. government during World War II. Now these men are working on evidence, not the story accepted by the public. This book does a good job of summing up McCarthy in three pages despised and defamed by the establishment, Senator Joseph McCarthy has been vindicated as a true champion of freedom. So let's put these two books side by side, representing the evidence, representing the story accepted by the public. Which one is Orwellian rectified history? Oh, Winston's quotation from earlier slide, the worldview of the party has imposed itself successfully upon the people and they are not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what has happened. We are in the midst, and by the way, he said this at the same time that Or Orwell was writing, we are in the midst of the greatest propaganda campaign the world has ever known. And we're still in it. We're going to close now with these two books right here. We're going to compare second grade readers. We got McGuffey. I love McGuffey readers, just great inspiring material. I once read a McGuffey reader, the sixth reader is the highest he went. I read in the sixth reader, but the vocabulary and the content was above my head. Yeah, it really was. It, 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 the sixth reader is like college reading today, college literature. But it nearly, I, I read a, the proposed speech of John Adams. It was a great, great thing to read that. It was thrilling, in fact. I remember that out of McGuffey's sixth reader. I was an adult. I didn't read it as, as a sixth grader. As an adult, I'd, and I memorized it. And I almost was tempted to quote it now, but I won't. I will, I will stop. Time is precious. Okay, we're going to compare that. This, by the way, started out in 1879, then 1896, reprinted. My father studied it as a little boy in grade school using McGuffey readers. We're going to compare that to a modern reader, modern meaning in our, in our day, and they haven't changed much since, 1983, Secrets and Surprises. We're going to look at two stories. Henry the Boot Black and Rachel's Birthday Party. You can take any story out of McGuffey and compare it with any story out of, what was that other one? McMillan. Any story and you're going to find the same thing. You're going to find two contrasting methods of teaching English, grammar, punctuation, and spelling. That's what the books are for. They're second grade material to try and teach the student to read and write. Okay, I'm going to read, I think I'll read uh, Rachel's birthday party first. Okay, we're going to open this up. This is the actual book right here. <coughs> Rachel had planned her party since last Friday. Her friends arrived early. She greeted each one with a broad smile. She received her presence at the door. 
She liked the African plant her best friend gave her. Then they all sat down. Rachel's father was going to entertain them. He did magic tricks. He forced a rabbit to stand up. Then he made Rachel's mother float in the air. She was level with the top of the table. She remained in the air for a whole minute. Everyone had such a good time. Isn't that great? Teach your little children to read and write and punctuate the English language, a little witchcraft and indoctrination thrown in. Every story in here has a similar taste. Now let me read the contrast, what they did 50 or 75 years earlier. Henry the Bootblack. Henry was a good, kind boy. His father was dead and his mother was very poor. He had a little sister about two years old. He wanted to help his mother, for she could not always earn enough to buy food for their little family. One day a man gave him a dollar for finding a pocketbook which he had lost. Henry might have kept all the money, for no one, had seen, no one saw him when he found it. But his mother had taught him to be honest and never to keep that which did not belong to him. What the with the dollar he bought a box, three brushes, and some blacking. He then went to the corner of the street and is said to every man whose boots did not look nice, Black your boots, sir, please. He was so polite that gentlemen soon began to notice him and to let him black their boots. The first day he brought home fifty cents which he gave to his mother to buy food. When he gave her the money, she said as she dropped a tear of joy, You are a dear good boy, Henry. I did not know how I could earn enough to buy bread, but I now think we can manage to get along quite well. Contrast those two readers and tell me who's behind each reader. What's the spirit that you felt when you read this one? And what's the spirit of this one? There are, I think, as I recall, ten character traits from the Bible found in Henry the Bootblack. In this book, there's only trivia, amusement, and witchcraft. This is the story accepted by the public. This series tomorrow, we're going to do half of the Know Your Liberty series. Tonight we did this one, Nurturing Our Cherished Myths, How and Why to Study History. We'll start out in the morning with original intent, the true nature and character of our federal government. If you thought you heard something new tonight, wait till tomorrow. We'll add more to it. The unknown American Republic of Republics laid out with evidence. State sovereignty, the original concept. And if there's still time at the end of the day, we'll take natural law, one of my very favorites the moral basis of a free society. Now, there are other lessons. We could come back another time if you so desire. The rise to empire, empire of debt. What has the government done to our money? Embracing global governance, advancing freedom in the 21st century. That's for another time. Know your liberty, Highland City Hall, January the 8th. Just want to be sure you know we're coming tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Anybody that's brave enough to stand it. Okay, we're going to close now. The old professor, Cleon Skousen, I dearly love. Next to my own dad, he's one of the great men of my life. Not long before he passed away, I went to see the old professor. I asked some wisdom, and I needed some wisdom. I asked his opinion. I was about to give a speech to a large congregation from people from all over the United States. They would be people from many different backgrounds and walks of life. I was kind of thinking the old man can help me. He'll know where to go and kind of direct me as to what to say and do. I was accomplished. I mean, I'd spoken hundreds of times all over the country for him. And I went in that day and I said to him, I've got this important speech to give. You know, and I chatted from, what do you think I should talk about? Well, he didn't even hesitate. He, he, he didn't even pause. He just said, testify of Jesus Christ. And from that moment on, I never leave a speech without ending with my testimony of Jesus Christ. He is the God of the land. 
and we must honor and respect and worship his holy principles. This inspiring picture done by John McNaughton, I enjoy thoroughly. I wrote him and asked him for permission to use it. He gave me permission. I look at that with, with, with comfort. I see the Savior as a center point. Why should we love liberty? I was assigned that topic a few months ago and spoke on it to an audience of 2,500 people in South Dakota. Why should we love liberty? And the bottom line is, liberty is of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the perfect law of liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In our preamble to the Constitution, it announces that the purpose for the Constitution is to secure the blessings of liberty. And then we sing about sweet land of liberty and the author of liberty. Why should we love liberty? Because it's of God. This, this group down here are you. They're the good people of America looking up to the Constitution and to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have some other people that have had problems in their life. They've made some bad decisions. There's old Satan lurking in the corner. All the people in the background are people of the past. This picture also brings me comfort and strength. I look at this one and I think about Jesus in his last supper. His best, most beloved friends had gathered with him. They chatted. He looked at one and he said, Simon, Simon, Satan desireth thee to sift thee as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now you are converted or you wouldn't have come tonight. Well, maybe you're a little weak in the knees, but you came anyway. When thou art converted to the principles of liberty, strengthen thy brethren. Do it kindly and gently and peacefully. No contention, no hard words, no finger shaking, no announcements of the doom that's about to come. Stay out of that area. With kindness and love and gentleness, teach the principles of American liberty. And then when they finished in that, in that meeting, what did they do? What was the last thing they do? There's a little verse that said, and they sang an hymn. Will the audience please stand? You thought this was never coming to an end. <laughs> now you're going to have to move a little bit so we can see the screen. Whoever the shadows on the screen, scrunch over a little bit. Keep scrunching until we can see the whole screen. This is a hymn that you're all familiar with. It has two verses. You probably have never seen the second one. They sang the second verse in Salt Lake on September the 17th and 18th in the state capitol, a beautiful choir led by Lex de Azevedo. It was a wonderful thing. They sang the second verse. So we're going to try both verses tonight. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And the second verse, shout to Jehovah all the earth. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Before him come with singing mirth. Know that Jehovah he God is. And when we finish that, who's our closing prayer? Would you please come up to the front closing prayer? We've got two people raising their hands. You're both going to pray? You're going to pray. Do you want to pray also? <laughs> we love you both. We'll let you pray tomorrow if you'll come. So when we're done, would you please offer a closing prayer? We're going to go back to the start. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Shout to Jehovah, all the earth. Serve ye Jehovah with gladness. Before him come with singing mirth. Know that Jehovah, he God is.